Nathalie Launay, who is going to be the moderator of this roundtable. I'm giving the floor right now. Merci Guy. Donc effectivement, donc on a une table ronde sur un sujet qui est portefeuille électronique. Quelle stratégie d'intermédiation numérique pour demain Donc aujourd'hui, on a plus d'une transaction. So today we have one transaction out of two of e-commerce in the world that is done via a smartphone. And so we're talking about application security, user friendliness and some legal guarantees. So we will see the rise of digital wallets, which is the most often term, the term that is most often used, whether they are payment digital wallets, identity, and tomorrow digital currency is uh, a new way of intermediation for the services of tomorrow. So we're going to explore this further with our four uh, speakers. There should be uh, Mr. Mirke Molik, who is supposed to represent the Open Wallet Foundation, but for health reasons, he couldn't make it to Lille. So we wish him uh, to get well soon. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, the four speakers. First, uh, Laurent Bailly with the glasses. Here we go. <laughs> Laurent has a diploma of uh, IT of Polytech Lille. So he must be very happy to be back to his alma mater and also in charge of the commercial development of ESSEC in Paris. He has a deep experience in the industry of payment in various uh, banks and functions and, the, and then joined Visa Europe and is today within Visa Europe the head of product strategy for the development of new products in the innovating themes such as open banking and digital identity. To his left, we have Etienne Plouvier, who developed a strong expertise in uh, digital identity and trusted services to promote the transformation, the digital transformation of companies representing Wardlad in a number of uh, associations and forums to promote the digital economy at European level and prepare the application of the new regulation AIDAS for identification and authentication and trusted services. To my left, Eric Thea. Eric, you, are, you have 20, uh, ex 20 years experience in innovation, digital innovation, and you've worked in different industries such as telecoms, smart cities, retail, or media. And since 2023, you are the product leader within BNY's, a trusted solution that you will present later on. We also have a lady, Lisa Allemand, who is a master two in law and strategy of security in with a thesis in security, who worked with the NSSI as project leader in charge of the regulatory framework. And since uh, December 2021, Lisa has been working with DG Connect as part of H4 eGov unit. And as such, you have followed the negotiations for the new ADAS regulation and the work of the expert group that we call the toolbox. And you've been working in writing the future execution or implementation acts whether it's a uh, Franklish, we probably have got implementation acts in this uh, roundtable. They does two. That was the object of debate earlier on. Without further ado, let us start our exchanges. And ladies first, I'm going to start with you. So before we get to the core of the topic, Lisa, I'm going to ask you to uh, remind us the ADAS2 roadmap following the adoption in the European Parliament in plenary vote on 29 February 2024 of the ADAS revision. You have the floor. Thank you, Nathalie. Uh, actually, yes, uh, the Parliament voted in plenary session the 29th of February the revision of the ADAS regulation. However, there are still some uh, administrative steps or procedures before the regulation is officially adopted and come into force. Today is the perfect day to talk about it because the adoption was made this morning by the Council unanimously. And the next steps are the signature in one of the plenary sessions of the European Parliament planned in the course of April 
and therefore following the signature in the European Parliament you will have the publication in the official bulletin of the European Union of the revised regulation. As some of you know, the regulation will come into force 20 days after being published in the official bulletin, which according to our estimates will make it coming to force in the course of May 24. Well, thank you very much for this roadmap concerning the regulatory aspect of the first uh, law that is very significant that accelerates uh, the future digital identity in Europe. And uh, since the presentation in June 21 of this IDAS revision, the European Commission has always motivated this urgency of uh, universal digital pan-European identity freely available to each European user for as a, an alternative solution that is both sovereign in both uh, sense European wide but also controlled by users but also highly secured an alternative to the wallet uh, proposed by the GAFAs. Could you explain to us uh, Lisa how this law of the IDES revision will give us the necessary tools to compete with uh, the digital giants from the United States. Well, first of all, I think we should align the fact that we are not in competition with the major platforms because we offer something different, which is a legal framework for the European digital identity wallet. As uh, reminded many times during the previous conference, the objective is to uh, supply citizens and companies in Union a wallet to be identified online everywhere from everywhere in Europe, which will cover many use cases in our daily lives. And the idea is to really reduce the administrative uh, load that we know in our transactions online. And this is a link with the object objectives of uh, the Digital Destiny for 2030 to have a secure digital identity controlled by users and recognized in, throughout the Union. So as you said, Natalie, first and foremost, the uh, European Digital Identity Wallet will be an alternative, to secure alternative to what is proposed by the major platforms. This GDPR that is fully applied in the IDAS regulation and this implies that citizens will share the minimum necessary data to access online services. We all experience that. We share a lot of data when we uh, without uh, seeing the usefulness of sharing all this data with service providers. So the idea is really to uh, reduce this uh, sharing of data to the only data necessary to get a specific service. So therefore, there'll be the observance of the GDPR services, the minimizing of data, the limitation of the finality of use of this data, the protection of data from the design of the wallet and by default. And it is so reminded the uh, revised regulation, I does regulation, sorry, that the EU, EU DI wallet will not use uh, the data of users for commercial use. Indeed, this, all these uh, GDPR references are reflected in the features that will contain the European uh, digital identity wallets. Users will have access to a dashboard with a history of transactions of services with whom they interacted and the data shared as part of these digital interactions. The wallet will also allow for the portability of data for users. Users will be able to submit directly some complaints with the data protection authorities, such as CNIL in France, in case of abusive use of their data. They will have the possibility to create and manage independently their uh, identifier if there is no legal identification required to access the service. In addition, to uh, these features that really promote the protection of privacy uh, and uh, date, private data, the wallet and the, frame, the revised frameworks allows for the supply of attribute uh, certificates legally recognized in Europe. And we all experience that of uh, scanning uh, a diploma or a um, 
medical certificate that is not signed and you share it with someone and we hope that everything will be all right in the process. But as such, there is no security from end to end that certifies that it is actually the user to which this diploma was delivered that actually sends it and there's no modification of the contents up to its reception. And therefore, these uh, attribute electronic certificates will be used mainly and on this round table is focused specifically on uh, payment. I think that this is a, a sector in which the electronic uh, certificates could have a, a real uh, added value. In addition, the revised regulation provides that all users, physical beings, will benefit from a qualified free electronic signature for non-professional use. I think once again we have all been faced with signing electronically through a qualified electronic signature that has the same legal value as a handwritten signature for online document. This possibility to be provided with the wallet free of charge for users, which will help many use cases and make it easier for online interaction, which is one of the objectives of the revised regulation. In addition to all these features, the regulation provides that the user, uh, st member states sorry, we could add features to what provided for in the regulation, especially to promote interoperability with the existing uh, identification tools. The IDS1, as uh, we now call it, has developed a lot of uh, schemes for uh, identification, uh, as 23 member states have done. That And that covers a population of over 93% of the European Union who have means of digital identification means. And there will be the possibility to create synergy with these existing resources and the EU DI wallet. In addition, and uh, this shows the difference with the solution offered by the major platforms. The European uh, platform will have to be certified by the highest level of guarantee according to the ADAS regulation. And therefore, there is a specific article in the revised agreement that provides for the certification for cybersecurity and non cybersecurity receipts of functional, operational, interoperability, you name it, for the EUDI wallets. And finally, there is a new governance scheme that is provided for in this revised regulation with the appointment of control bodies both for the trusted services from 2014 but also for European uh, wallets. So therefore, there will be a supervision of these providers ex ante and ex post as provided for by the regulation. So I think that all these examples of the features, the legal framework, the new trusted services that will interact with the wallet shows the real added value and the singularity compared with the services that we have today. We should also underline the fact that the European wallet will be free of charge to use it and its use will be on a voluntary basis. So if users do not want to use it, the service providers will have to accept other ways of authentication, electronic authentication, for these users to log on to online services. A contrario, when uh, citizens access on a voluntary basis some uh, access online and identify the major digital platforms, these will have the obligation to accept the EUDI wallet as a means of identification. And this obligation also weighs on private uh, service providers, especially in the banking industry and other sectors, when a uh, strong authentication of the client is required, they will have to accept the UDI wallet as a means of identification, if these, of course, are volunteers to do it. In all cases, the wallet is not dedicated to replace the current processes offered by banks, but rather come as a complement upon request by clients as a means of identification, as an extra means of identification. And as again, this roundtable uh, is dedicated to introduce the use case of uh, payment, I would like to underline the fact that there are uh, large-scale pilot uh, projects, as you all know about, to experiment use cases for the UDI wallet 
on these four <coughs> pilot uh, projects, three focuses on payment, some have other use cases. Uh, I would say that out of the three, not all are dedicated to payment, but the three or four uh, at least talk about payment. And I think that this is what we'll be talking about uh, today with the other participants. Indeed, we have the ASP uh, called Novid, which uh, deals primarily with uh, payments. We also have initiatives for with uh, we're going to look at with uh, Ten Puvay and Monsieur Bailly, uh, also with payments, and we also have uh, initiatives for uh, identification, not specifically for payments, but for subscription to financial services. Now, for payments, the rules will not. Um, uh, include the da the banks or other third parties uh, in the uh, authorization process, but will, uh, for example, if there's a, a remote payment or proximity payment when you lose the NFC or the QR codes. And we're going to talk about the case use for payments in particular, but uh, with Mr. Laurent Bailly, Lisa, I'm going to bother you if ever we have a question, but uh, more related to future acts of implementation over which you have uh, the uh, onerous responsibilities in the months to come. I just want to say that Laurent today is running the working group at Visa for uh, payments for the WCC consortium, which defines and pilots the case of uh, travel. So Laurent and other uh, finance services like that. So Laurent, can you talk about these uh, services for payments and give us the uh, answers to tell us how the uh, uh, ecosystems for banks use uh, digital identification to integrate uh, wallets? Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for everybody. Indeed, we we have the privilege of being in charge of the task force, the working group uh, for the WVC uh, consortium, which uh, groups a number of actors from the business world and the digital world, and uh, also for uh, payments, notably for Worldline. And we also have as an objective the definition of the specifications for payments for the future European digital wallet. Now, today, as you know, the fundamentals for uh, digital identification is run by the SD, uh, it is do, um, two um, project. Now, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, so correct me if I'm not right, if not correct, but I believe in 2023 it was confirmed that it would be in the S does 2 uh, project that you have an identification, strong identification required for a certain number of actors and notably in the financial sector. So we're positioning ourselves in this uh, working group to look at the consequences of all of this and to see what are the best ways to integrate this functionality. What does that mean in concrete terms? That means that in the future, you want to have strong identification for the payment or you want to activate or access your bank online and you use your bank app with a notification uh, service. That means that you will also word our mobile application for the same thing. So it'll be the choice of the citizen up to, it's up to the citizen to choose which one they want to use, but that has consequences, obviously. It's rather complicated technically, but our objective is to, once again through this task force, to propose to the European Commission and to the experts of the toolbox for the IRF. It's a, I'm sure a little bit of a alphabet soup and a jargon for those who don't know about it, but uh, these are the specifications for the future European wallet. And today, so, so uh, which currently does not have any payment characteristics. So the idea is to use this uh, WVC uh, consortium. And as Natalie was saying, there's other uh, consortiums, there are other players that are working on this as well. But the idea is to define the specifications. And what we wish to do is to go beyond that and to do a pilot project on a certain number of select usage cases to confront those specifications. So we have a certain number of principles. We already have a certain conviction within the consortium and to say that payments are a usage case that will allow 
the future uh, European uh, digital ID wallet to develop. But if you take the example, for example, of the fact that you have to use your wallet only every once or once every 10 or 20 years to open a bank account, it's, it's, it's very probable that this famous wallet will remain uh, lost among the applications that you never use. On the contrary, if you use your wallet almost every day to pay things on the internet, as we'll say if you maybe you to pay things in stores as well, then we have usage cases that are really part of the daily life and will favor the adoption of this wallet and really get it, get it up to cruising speed if we want to hit the 80% of European citizens by 2030. That's the ambition of the European Commission, obviously. So that is the credo. We have this credo. We've adopted this credo. Um, we, but it has to start with the basics. So the SCA, uh, the, the, the account identification, uh, you have a certain number of characteristics uh, for identification that need to be taken into account, which are not necessarily trivial. We are at the crossroads of uh, the ADS2 uh, and the rate payment regulation, which integrates the provisions to make sure that the so that the BA would be uh, part of the reflections of any future RTS. In other words, the specifications for the European digital wallet. So it's something that is quite complex, and. When you talk, for example, about the dynamic linking, how can you be sure that this function, which is key in the word of PST, do uh, uh, and other uh, payment initiatives? So uh, there's a certain number of examples of those types of cases where which on which we're working currently, because this wallet uh, must it must be possible that the consumer ultimately uh, can uh, record you know uh, their information with their bank so that in the future they can identify themselves. So the, so you identify yourself uh, with your European wallet in the future, and so that means you have certain specifications that will be necessary for the portals of the bank. So um, the, all of this has to be harmonized throughout all of Europe. Uh, and one of our main uh, goals is to minimize the impact on the financial infrastructures and on the banks in particular. So we think that the the financial financial and payment uh, world has suffered a great deal because of the implementation of PSD2. And so we want to make sure that we can give a maximum of standardization wherever possible. Uh, and this is through the uh, NWVC uh, consortium and also the European Commission, which wants to really minimize the impact on potential flows. So this is part of our short-term goals. Um, we also have another uh, objective, and that is to do a diagnostic of the payment means. Everybody knows uh, plastic credit cards, of course, uh, but uh, we also have uh, cross-border payments, uh, bank transfers, account-to-account uh, uh, -account transfers. So we uh, uh, provide uh, expertise in these sorts of issues as well to uh, look at the two cases, not just the the um, uh, bank card payments, credit card payments, or plastic card payments, as you call them, or, or account-to-account Count payments. So, so you've already said a lot. You've also pointed out that the payment case will be the usage case that will allow us to drive the adoption of the wallet. And I agree. As a consultant uh, for uh, payments, I think it could be one of the best usage cases for payments. So you might dream of a unique uh, European ID uh, wallet that um, would also have uh, payment methods included, and one of the solutions called What Link as well that would be easy to use. Uh, we also have XP wallets or One Click to Pay, uh, which Visa is currently launching in France, which are sort of competing uh, systems that are very simple, very simple systems. But I think we're trying to look for something like that for the digital wallet as well. Yes, I think there's. There's a moment where you have the regulatory uh, framework, which uh, requires strong identification, but we also have to look at what's being driven by the market, and we have to be able to mix within a single transaction the credentials for payments and the credentials for identification. Uh, I don't know how you, you, you translate in French the word credential, but I, so I use the English word credential, but, uh, but so I apologize for that. So anyway, it's the idea to have a single strong identification 
to be able to verify that the person is older than 18 years old and can also sign uh, the identification uh, for a payment. So this is done with a single identification act and not two. So there's a lot of usage cases that are being worked on and, and will be invented in the future, no doubt. But um, so if we look to the future a bit, uh, we think that there will also be a wonderful opportunity for wallets in general and, and not just not just for the uh, European digital uh, identification wallet, but also for wallets in general to, to contain credential cards or token cards or, or token uh, IBANs to um, initiate payments. And all of these things are part of a usage case that could potentially be used on a daily basis. I mean, we did a study at the end of 2022 that shows that 72% of European citizens regularly use a mobile wallet. 30% uh, of the gen general Generation Z in Europe at the end of 2022 only used mobile apps for payments. That's all they used as payments. So, so we we need to be able to fight against that as well because we have uh, usages that are already f really in, you know installed and, and and applied and adopted. So we have to be basically compete with the existing uh, classic wallets like Apple, Google, uh, Samsung, or or domestic uh, like Bzoom or other domestic uh, wallets. And so um, we have to be very creative to uh, go up against that. Even if one of the strong points of the European digital identification wallet is we have this sort of regalian. Uh, uh, identification system and uh, things will be a lot more perfected than what's currently on the market. But uh, but uh, so technologically, it's it's possible. And what's interesting is that there is the opening of on on the the solutions on uh, 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 card payments uh, in, in stores. We have those platforms that exist already, but we could create pl applications where you can do uh, payment in stores through Android. Um, uh, through smartphone, at least at least through Android, we can uh, deploy that capacity uh, existing on Android. But but what's interesting is that Apple just um, created their NFC controller, and uh, now uh, that allows uh, with that same uh, technology that you have in Android to do uh, an application that could be the wallet of the iPhone. And so and so it's very recent because it's since the seventh of March of this year. So. But it's something that we're looking at in the consortium because we think that's a real opportunity to create usage cases that are even more important and create even greater value uh, for, for our wallets and um, for our wallet and so to be able to, to and that and we're really in the wallet wars. Uh, how can we be the top of the wallet uh, pile? How can I be the preferred wallet of the European citizens of, of, of tomorrow? And, uh, and, you know, how can I make sure that the, uh, at the at the last page of and to make sure that uh, the, my my identification app is not on the last page of my of my iPhone, but it's at the top. It's at the top. And so this is this is the challenges that we have. And uh, and in uh, the NWC uh, consortium, we're investing a great deal to establish the possibility, the the the, the field of possibilities for the future. <clears throat> you said the DNA, the Digital Market Act. Uh, yesterday, the European Commission launched an investigation against Apple because they opened the NFC, but they continue to apply fees on the development of apps. And so more generally, Apple could keep a percentage of all the um, marketplace products. Or So we have a bit, all the different business models for these types of uh, business cases or usage cases for uh, wallets. So how can, so is this something that you're dealing with and how can we deal with it in the case of the European uh, digital identification wallet. Well, I think the question of the business model is not specific to payments. I think in general, the question is how the digital wallets of the future will be uh, will be released. Will they be released by the government, by the member state? Will it be uh, issued from a private uh, entity, which will be de which will have a mandate from the government? Uh, is it a consortium of private companies? 
that uh, can issue the wallet. And what is the business model for that? Is it is it uh, is it financial? Is it uh, uh, financed by um, the, by public sources by public funding? Uh, is it uh, is it uh, traditional private business uh, models? Um, there's a number of different uh, ways that this could be approached. Uh, in a, maybe a balanced approach uh, between the banks or the uh, manufacturers of wallets, and that's also something that's uh, key. Also also to this discussion is because we often hear, I know that the European Commission has also planned to to have a open source wallet to limit costs. And that's also very important to keep in mind, especially for member states that don't want to invest themselves in these technologies. The first version of the open source wallet was published uh, a few days ago, as a matter of fact. So that allows us to have a basis um, on which to have your own um, national wallet, or, but all of this costs is, costs money, and, and it's something that the the question of the business model is not specific to payments, but I think that payments can help establish a business model. Indeed, we have the uh, do to uh, um, uh, text that that doesn't talk about the business model, but it, uh, but but we also have the question of liabilities, uh, the legal liabilities. Um, we have, uh, uh, for example, the uh, issuers of payments are under a heavy regulatory uh, constraint. And as you said, uh, you have the PSR, the future uh, regulations for future payment services, which will uh, oblige um, these uh, issuers of financial payments to reimburse their customers in certain cases. And so I just wanted to uh, get back to this subject. Lisa, do you think a future act of implementation could resolve these thorny problems? Uh, I think the business model might depend on the different member states, but the, but the question of legal liability uh, for the issue, for issuers of uh, financial payments in terms of strong identification uh, in the domain of payments, uh, strong customer identification. How do, how do you see this? Yes, the question of responsibility or liability is, as you say, very thorny indeed. What you have to keep in mind is that the IDS uh, regulation that has been published says that Article 11 of the text, as it was written, applies to the suppliers of uh, European uh, di suppliers of European digital wallets. So it means that the regulations uh, say that the mm, the suppliers remain liable in the case of incident or litigation or dispute related to these wallets. And so, as uh, was underlined in all the cases. Regardless of the means for issuing the wallet, there are three specifications in the regulations. Either it's issued by a member state or under the mandate of a member state or independently of a member state, but recognized by the member state. And so the regulation specifically uh, states the uh, responsibility of the member state as a supplier of the wallet, indirectly or directly, uh, to be responsible in the case of litigation or incident related to the wallet. And so in Indeed, we have a sort of gray area regarding certain usage cases, notably for payments and the liability of uh, regarding users, as, as you mentioned. So it'll be probably be part of the, the PSR regulation, which will have to uh, define the interoperability of these wallets and the liabilities and responsibilities of different parties. Yes, in any case, the commission doesn't have any empowerment to uh, enact a, an act of, of, of liability. Um, okay, thank you very much for that uh, clarification. So we're gonna continue on this subject of payments with Etienne Pluvier, who represents World Line and also the EWDC uh, consortium. So again, we have a future regulation that should define the responsibilities of the different parties uh, that use or are involved with the wallet, but could also indicate the minimum level of certification necessary for the wallets that will be used for the authentication, for strong authentication. So for you, Etienne, do you think that what level must we need to be able to have a strong identification, a strong author authentication, to be compliant with the regulations for payments, or do we have what we call the PID uh, to do that? Yes, hello to everybody. First, I would say that 
the case, the usage case of payments, we at Worldline, we believe that it's the usage case that will really push the adoption of the wallet by the, the great mass of the of users. But And uh, so that's what's going to really push this adoption. Next, maybe we could do a little focus on the payment usage case with three different types of usage cases. The first is the authentication or the authorization for a payment. Something that already exists today with PS, PSDF2, with 3DF, uh, and the other uh, initiatives that we have what we call a, a control uh, access server, access control server, um, where you go through that ACS or control access control server that uh, allows you to authorize the payment. And now in Belgium, for example, we have an application called It's Me, which is a uh, electronic application used by uh, the Belgians. And uh, this is something that the banks asked Worldline to set up in place of their old home banking system so that they could have a stronger sense of uh, authentication. So that's the first payment usage case. The second usage case is what I call tokenization. This is uh, the payment data. It could be the bank card. It could be your it could be the expiration date, uh, the PIN code. It could be also the e IBAN. Uh, it could be also the digital euros that could be within the euros, um, which will allow for payments. And, and then there's a third domain, which is, and that's where I think really the wallet can really uh, do something really different from what exists today. And that's the combination of of uh, identity and payment information. It's it's so where you can buy a bottle of alcohol, it shows that you're over 18 years old, and you can confirm that, yes, I'm older than 18 years old and I confirm the payment. And that's all new. That's new. That gives a new user experience and because the first two in terms of the authorization of a payment or or the uh, the use the payment usage, uh, all these things are something that exists and has existed for a long time. Uh, but today, most of the means of authentication and identification for the bank are more substantial than than uh, then uh, um, immaterialized. And so when I talk about what's substantial or immaterial, I'm, I'm really talking about the ADS uh, V1.0 uh, regulations, which really uh, sets the specifications for authentication and identification. So, so these are based on two main axes. The first is the verification of the identification of the user. Uh, we have to control an ID document, an identification document. And then you have the method of identification that's what we call weak with a password, maybe multi-factor identification when you have to do something more substantial. And in the high level is where you have a secure element, uh, either an electronic chip or something, some other application to, uh, to for uh, higher uh, multi-factor authentication. Now, usually when the banks use these uh, systems, they always use substantial uh, methods. Now, when you use a high security wallet, uh, let's say you look at the uh, France identity uh, application, I put my NFC uh, bank card in it. Uh, and, and, and then I could insert and create a pin code that I put into my uh, chip card. And then if I want to identify myself uh, with uh, this, um, what I do is I take my card, I enter my PIN code, but I could imagine that in the future, you, you're not going to do um, the same uh, type of payment if you have your Apple wallet, your, your, your Android wallet, your click and pay, etc. So I think that today the banks in the financial sector are really going to ask for substantial uh, identification uh, as a reference. But the substantial level, the high level for the NSFDU and uh, the wallet, I think today has not yet been defined. That means that we could base it on the ADS-1 uh, for digital identification, but the wallet goes farther than uh, uh, digital identification. It has attributes and other. So when you look at the, uh, the low uh, or weak, uh, substantial and high levels of securitization, there's a certain number of things that have to be certified. And so in any case, I think it's a good thing to have have a regulation that defines the rules to identify and authentify uh, an act, but it means, but I don't think that we reinvent the wheel from the financial side. I think we have to base ourselves on the existing EDES uh, regulations and then we define how to use it according to.
to the risk analysis and the usage cases as defined. And from that moment, for me, it's up to the experts who will define these regulations, uh, all the different regulations you talked about, the PSR, PSDF, and all that. Uh, how do you use the EDIS wallet? And, um, and you can see that there's a lot of elements that uh, can need to be uh, taken into account to define the right levels depending on the certification schema for the wallet uh, as determined. Yes, your experience of the use of the uh, FIN app. Uh, I'm sure it's not going to be used uh, for identification, but uh, what about the adoption, uh, not just of users, but also of uh, the shops and, uh, um, and trades, trades people? Um, so when you have the future wallet, either a European or national wallet, or uh, yeah, uh, there's all these different wallets that could be in a, perhaps different from the European digital identification wallet. Yes, the FIN app obviously obviously has a high level and therefore can only do high authentication. Now obviously if you can do high you can obviously you can obviously do low, you know, so much more easily. And that will allow you to have a better user experience because, once again, if you want to have the same user experience uh, as the tools that are used today, like Google Pay and others, by most users, we have to have that same level of experience. That's the first thing. Next, in terms of interoperability, we have different uh, ways of working regarding payments. We have the European Payment Initiative. Uh, which is for account to account, which could work with the uh, European wallet. And then we also have the digital euro, which should be compatible. Cherry Breton said that now that we have a European wallet, what are we going to put in it? Well, let's put the digital euro in it. Well, let's see how that rolls out. But in any case, Worldline is working on these subjects, on the EPI, the European Payment Initiative, or the digital euro. As I said, there's three usage cases. If I take the digital euro, when we look in the working groups that are working on that, we have 77 usage cases that are currently being working on that are going to depend on the, the QR code, the sales point, the online, offline, uh, web to commerce, uh, P2P, um, uh, reimbursements, as you said earlier. So it's quite complex. And so the level of security that's necessary to do all those different usage cases must also be refined uh, and uh, honed by the experts uh, in uh, payments. And that's why I think there's going to be a new sales pitch for the shops because we have now um, 1.4 million um, Customers at Worldline, um, shops at Worldline. Il y a un coût, il y a une étude, il y a un impact pour les commerçants pour ouvrir ce nouveau bouton de paiement sur un site e-commerce, mais aussi après demain sur les TPE, sur les terminaux de paiement électronique. Donc avant d'arriver à ça, il faudra vraiment qu'il y ait un impact, un besoin, une masse critique d'utilisateurs qui vont, comme l'a fait Apple et Google, arriver vers les banques et vers les commerçants en disant voilà, moi j'ai besoin d'accepter ce moyen de paiement, sinon je perds des, je perds des clients quoi, en fait dessus. Et là, le, le wallet, je pense, européen, euh, avec euh, tous les aspects privacy, on a parlé, RGPD, le, le tableau de bord, comme, euh, comme Lisa disait, le fait que les reading parties doivent s'enregistrer également pour réellement déclarer ce qu'elles vont utiliser sur le wallet sous le contrôle de l'utilisateur, et donc gagner, parce que derrière, la fraude va être réduite, l'expérience utilisateur et donc, euh, va être agrandie et facilitée. Donc ça pourrait être beaucoup d'économies et de coûts euh, générés pour, euh, euh, enfin de coûts réduits pour les entreprises, mais de revenus générés pour les entreprises. Ça peut être différenciant par rapport à ces wallets qui existent aujourd'hui, dont on sait euh, notamment qu'ils capturent des données pour essayer de vendre des, des services après aux consommateurs. Oui, effectivement, euh, nous avons donc une complexité de situations et de cas d'usage. Tout à l'heure, j'étais étonnée, 77 cas d'usage en euro numérique. Je pense que pour le wallet d'identité numérique européen, on doit bien être de là des 77 usages tout compris. Donc nous avons une complexité, mais une opportunité à saisir. Et en fait, on n'a pas que le cas d'usage paiement hein, qui intéresse les services financiers euh, 
Naturellement, il y a également le cas d'usal de l'identification électronique fiable pour la souscription à un nouveau service financier. Tout simplement, ouvrir par exemple un, une demande de crédit, euh, demander par exemple une nouvelle carte de banca bancaire avec crédit renouvelable, tout ça en conformité avec les exigences de, des lois applicables en matière de lutte contre le blanchiment et le financement du terrorisme, et naturellement signer son contrat avec une signature électronique qualifiée, avec la même valeur probante qu'une euh, signature manuscrite. Mais pour tous ces cas d'usage d'identification électronique requis par la loi, donc les euh, banques auront l'obligation de proposer le wallet, ce que vous avez d'ailleurs évoqué tout, tout à l'heure, Lisa. Mais euh, d'après vous, Étienne, avons-nous absolument besoin d'un seul wallet d'identité numérique fourni par le gouvernement. Si ce n'est pas le cas, comment les fournisseurs de wallets alternatifs pourront-ils survivre en concurrence avec un wallet qui sera gratuit pour l'utilisateur, qui permettra une signature électronique qualifiée gratuite hors usage professionnel et par rapport au wallet donc fourni par l'État ben, Oui, comme je le disais, au niveau des de, comment dire, du niveau de sécurité requis pour les services financiers, encore une fois, c'est toujours une analyse de risque. Donc en fonction du risque, on va demander quel est le bon niveau, substantiel ou élevé, en fonction de ce que sera ce niveau substantiel ou élevé. Et euh, en effet, on peut considérer également la, euh, ben, des choix d'adoption par les utilisateurs. Est-ce que tout le monde voudra utiliser le même wallet pour toutes ces transactions numériques Pour le service régalien, peut-être le wallet régalien. Pour des services de paiement, est-ce que je vais utiliser un wallet régalien ou un wallet privé est-ce que pour d'autres services où je n'ai pas du tout envie, des services de voyage et autres, j'ai peut-être envie d'avoir un autre wallet, de ne pas mettre tous mes données sensibles dans le, maître, dans le même wallet Ça, c'est une première chose. Donc, c'est cet aspect de, de niveau de sécurité. Est-ce que le wallet fin, demain, s'il devient un wallet, permettra aussi le niveau substantiel ou pas Parce que s'il ne permet pas le niveau substantiel, ben, la partie, euh, on va dire, friction sera trop forte pour de nombreux cas d'usage. Donc, il y aura de la place également, je pense, pour des wallet providers privés qui peuvent avoir aussi une flexibilité euh, pour proposer des services plus sur mesure au niveau, euh, au niveau de certains secteurs métiers. Ça peut être des secteurs euh, hôteliers, par exemple, pour faire du check-in, du booking d'hôtels. Ça peut être le secteur aérien. Aujourd'hui, Ayata développe euh, des wallets et des pilotes pour passer en biométrie complète depuis le boarding jusqu'à d'une ville, jusqu'à l'embarquement, euh, enfin le débarquement sur une autre ville. Et donc, euh, on peut imaginer aussi des wallets spécifiques pour certains, euh, certains métiers de voyage également, avec euh, des choix, etc. Moi, ce que je pense qui peut être intéressant, c'est qu'on ait un wallet qui peut être un peu un cœur, euh, je veux dire, la clé de voûte de mon identité numérique, qui permette ensuite de pouvoir activer d'autres wallets. Et comme ça, parce que là, aujourd'hui, on a beaucoup de wallets privés qui ont, font face à des systèmes de fraude pour la partie enrôlement, activation du wallet. On pourrait imaginer que le wallet d'identité permette d'activer de manière sécurisée un wallet privé qui peut être ensuite, n'a pas besoin forcément d'être certifié à des niveaux substantiels élevés ou même juste substantiels, donc avec des coûts de certification qui vont être moindres, et proposer également une flexibilité, une, des changements de version beaucoup plus fortes en fonction des besoins utilisateurs. Et, et je pense que ça, c'est un point clé pour pouvoir euh, faire un marché qui, qui émerge et qui croît. Et ce marché, il va émerger, je pense qu'on en revient à la question clé, quand on va parler d'opérateurs privés, c'est le business model. C'est-à-dire à partir du moment où il n'y a pas de business model et il n'y a pas de retour sur investissement, vous n'allez avoir aucune compagnie qui va investir pour permettre ces transactions ou ces échanges financiers. Aujourd'hui, je vais prendre le cas du paiement. Quand vous avez la, entre la banque du payeur, la banque du payé et les systèmes de cartes et des acteurs au milieu comme Worldline, on investit, on permet de sécuriser les échanges, etc. parce qu'on a possibilité d'avoir des rémunérations sur ce service qui est opéré. Si demain, il n'y a aucun acteur qui est rémunéré, aucun acteur va investir sur ce système-là, il ne va pas marcher. Donc le fait de trouver un partenariat public-privé avec un écosystème qui permet d'émerger, de rémunérer à la fois les wallets issueurs, mais également demain les attributs issueurs pour le service qu'ils rendent après-demain à la relaying party, parce que c'est la relaying party qui va retirer tous les coûts de la baisse de fraude et de la génération de revenus. Voilà, c'est ce modèle-là qu'il faut petit à petit mettre en place. Là, on est au tout début. On essaie de mettre en place les, les standards technologiques qui permettent d'assurer le maximum de privacité. Mais c'est vers ça qu'il faut aller à terme. 
Effectivement, le règlement EIDAS, qui est fondé sur la neutralité technique, autorise déjà des acteurs privés à fournir des services de confiance, des moyens EIDAS. Ce matin, on a évoqué effectivement l'identité numérique La Poste, donc c'est un moyen privé. On aura bientôt prochainement, je crois comprendre, Iris également, qui est un acteur privé. Et on pourrait également avoir des fournisseurs de wallet. De... Wardline, en fait, n'est pas qu'une PTEC, Étienne. Vous ne faites pas que des services pour l'écosystème des paiements et les marchands. Vous proposez des offres techniques dans l'ensemble du processus de dématérialisation numérique. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire un petit peu plus sur cette vision plus, oui. plus large que uniquement dédiée paiement dans la vision EIDAS Oui, ben, la dématérialisation est au sein de la stratégie de Wardline et l'identité numérique. Alors, la dématérialisation, en deux mots, il y a trois grands piliers hein, de la dématérialisation. Euh, qui, qui se base d'ailleurs sur euh, IDAS, la version 1. Il y aura la première partie qui est l'identité numérique dont on parle là actuellement. La deuxième partie qui sera les échanges des attributs. Et puis la signature électronique de contrat pour confirmer légalement qu'on est d'accord avec, euh, avec euh, quelque chose. Et ensuite, on aura également l'archivage à vocation probatoire de toutes ces données-là. Donc ça, c'est le scope de, de la dématérialisation et l'identité numérique pour un acteur comme Orlan, est très lié au paiement numérique. Il y a tout ce qui concerne l'AML, le KYC au niveau bancaire. Donc c'est très... et l'anti-manchiment, euh, l'AML. Euh, donc ça, c'est très important. Donc Orlan gère, par exemple, euh, l'access control server, comme je le disais, de, de toutes les banques principales en, en France. Donc ça fait des milliards de transactions qui permettent également ensuite aux utilisateurs, avec des moyens d'authentification forts, de confirmer qu'ils autorisent le paiement. On permet également, en fait, quelque part, ça rejoint un peu les attestations d'attributs avec des licences open banking de pouvoir récupérer attributes to get the IBAN under the control of users or financial transaction to estimate uh, a credit whether people are credit worthy. But we also have beyond payment solutions, uh, the uh, identity access uh, management. We have the fraud management, the trusted services that we also do, and all this allows us to accompany our clients to dematerialization. But with the wallet and the entity and payment, our vision is uh, the parallel that we made with the acceptance of payment. Today, the 1.4 million of our clients come to see us to make uh, acceptance of payment by different means uh, easier. So we need uh, an intermediate uh, between uh, the banks and the cards to accept payments from uh, shopkeepers. And we think that shopkeepers will have the same issue tomorrow with the wallets and the identity providers. So they will have to have a number of connections because they will not only have to accept the French wallets in France, but also wallets from all European citizens. There's no uh, borders or tourists uh, traveling So having this acceptance of identity or payment enriched by with identity, that's the third case we're talking about, combining the data of with payment, is a strategic call for Worldline. And this is why we're going to have a gateway, a hub, identity hub, to allowing a shopkeeper very e easily to connect to Worldline and have access to all the wallets connected to the, this hub to trigger payments in a secure way. Thank you for this vision and to transition to uh, BNY's uh, company represented by Eric today, which is also a private company, also providing trusted and AIDA services and secure solution for digital identity and exchange of other attributes. So Eric, could you tell us more about BNY's and how you migrate from ADAS 1 to ADAS 2? Well, thank you, Nathalie. Hello, everyone. Be wise are the specialists of digital identity, uh, personal information flows, and uh, processing of sensitive data. And I'll say a few words about the history of the company because it's interesting to see how we've evolved and through this uh, compare with the evolution of EDAS. We were born in the year 2000 in Clermont-Ferrand, France, where we started uh, processing data And it started, uh, it all started uh, the evolution and growth and diversification because when uh, we process health data, which are the most 
demanding data to process, we can do other things. And uh, we started with that. We, we've we built our own data center in uh, Clermont-Ferrand to master the infrastructure. And as you said, we started offering electronic signature. So we're very happy to have among our uh, clients, uh, telecom operators, the National uh, Bar, French Bar Association, and a number of insurers. And then when it came uh, 2014, ADAS 1, where we were recognized as a QTSP, a Qualified Trust Service Provider, and uh, this is where we had our services recognized for the qualified certificate for electronic signature, qualified certificate for uh, the seal, and the uh, date stamping. So that was 2014. Now, 10 years later, we have uh, developed more services. We've developed uh, KYC, so 14 million uh, files processed to date. And for internal reasons, we uh, also need these registers to for the traceability of our transaction. We also have uh, archiving services. And what's interesting to see is that all these services we developed can be found in one way or another in ADAS2. So it shows that the regulation adapts to the evolution of the market and the industry. And tomorrow, will be able to be officially recognized on uh, uh, through the certification tomorrow. And I talked about the trusted services, but uh, we also talk about uh, the wallet because this is the whole point of this. We are also a wallet supplier. We consider ADAS2 as an accelerator for the industry. And since a regulatory framework that will define the rules of play and harmonize practices. And within that framework, everyone will be free to differentiate itself and off propose the difference. And the three points we would like to be different is includes the management of uh, the data heritage, the expression of uh, consent and the GDPR rights for users and also to talk about the uh, business model, how to create value for service providers within a wallet. That was, these are the three axes of differentiation that we see in our wallet. And in a nutshell, to express why we are positioned on wallets and what has guided our development to date is uh, the freedom of choice for end users to decide what is sharing, what they share, what they will not share, with whom and, and when. And this is one of the reasons why I decided to build our own data center, not to be submitted to the US Cloud Act and have to uh, go against uh, the interest of end users. And therefore, we are very happy to see that in this spirit, we have that in ADAS too and it is uh, what has guided the development to date. So today, the strategy is that you're going to issue a wallet, you supply a wallet to a, a state or to uh, offer a wallet to a user that could, could be derived from the same concept and same technology as uh, specified in ADAS2 and uh, the future implementation acts or the reference architectures, or are you going to be positioned as a certificate, electronic certificate provider, qualified one, advanced to be uh, with you as, as trusted qualified suppliers? Well, we want to offer a wallet, but we also want to have a European footprint. That's something that we must underline. And it was said earlier, actually, there are three uh, wallet supplies models, so either the member states or the under, under mandates of a member states or recognized by the uh, member states. So this is going to be the rules of play that we're going to follow 
And what we would like to do is supply a wallet that can be used by physical people, by real people, but also for legal entities. With a topic we've been working on is the relationship between the various identities, between uh, the uh, natural beings and legal entities uh, and uh, proxy and uh, colleagues and employees and all. So these are profiles that we're looking at that will make us make us stand out from the crowd, allowing us uh, later on to offer the best user experience possible in a secure way, a compliant procedure and all this to increase the operational efficiency. And to come back to your question, we will be uh, wallet suppliers, but also suppliers of uh, attribute uh, certificate, uh, qualified certificate, attribute certificates, and uh, as, uh, as such will be interoperable <coughs> with other wallets. So you be a qualified electronic uh, uh, certificates for payment uh, players or banking players, potentially. Well, what's interesting is to see how the ecosystem will evolve and how the various players are going to position themselves in this ecosystem, because you can be uh, a supply of wallet and therefore supply verifiable credentials to a relying party. Uh, sorry, sorry for the English terms, but uh, the service providers that can consume this data. We always talk about the ecosystem. We could imagine as well that banks tomorrow, since uh, they have data on users, could be a source of data, or even uh, QA suppliers, that the IBAN could be tomorrow an attribute that is part of the identity of a natural being uh, through uh, suppliers like us supply this kind of attribute to wallets, which would be much more interesting than just uh, the vision of the regulation on instant uh, transfers of checking the IBAN with the likeliness of uh, checking the name and to which belong the bands because then with a quiet fight certificate it will not be likely it is yes it is issued by an authority in an authentic way there could be interesting to limit fraud so i'd like to thank all our four uh, speakers for answering my questions that were a bit challenging i know but to continue this rather than have a two-way <coughs> Uh, exchange on a more open and you can actually uh, exchange between yourselves on a more social theme. What are the societal consequences of this new uh, intermediation uh, form? That's one of the questions of this roundtable. I'm going to add a question, underlying question. Is the wallet a question of intermediation or not, or rather a matter of trust? So I would like to speak first on this societal theme, a philosophical, philosophical theme. I'll go first. I, uh, I'm reacting to the intermediation uh, aspect because I think that the construction of the uh, EUDI wallet is decentralization. It's an infrastructure of digital identity that is decentralized. So this means that the European citizen has in his or her hands the data and certificates supplied by trusted sources, of course, and will be able to uh, present to third parties presenting the data he or she wants. So we know we're not even this architecture is really the opposite of this logic of intermediation because there's no intermediate. In no intermediary, there are technical intermediaries because the wallet must communicate with the suppliers of certificates or uh, identity and so on, and the uh, relaying parties, the shopkeepers, the governments and so on. But it, it's in the hands of citizens. And I think this is something, this European model is 
not the same models in other regions of the world. And I think that from a citizen point of view, it has a very positive impact in my opinion. Lisa, maybe a comment, because I think that's exactly the approach. Yes, exactly, it is. And once again, sorry for the English terms, but the empowerment concept actually applies here, because we're going to supply this tool to the citizens who so wish to make it easier and make the interactions more secure for uh, with service providers. This is a major societal consequence on citizens, and it will allow make uh, interaction online interactions easier, develop new ones, with the consequence of preparing society for whether through major communication campaign, vulgarization, or preparing a citizen of what are they what they will become because we are working on a major change of our physical world to a digital world and it will have significant consequences in the life of many people and i'm not talking about on behalf of the european commission but on member states there is preparation work and ensure that uh, citizens understand this what's at stake and accept it and uh, use it within the limits that they decided so they can benefit from this new tool. Etienne would like to add something to this? Well, yes, uh, well, I wanted first a word of thank you for the Commission and the Parliament for having succeeded in issuing this regulation. I heard that the uh, now we have a date, well, late May, because we had lots of questions. Uh, so uh, before this regulation enters into force, and a lot of our clients are waiting for this coming into force to start working on it. And I can see there is still a lot of work to be done. And we did talk about it uh, with uh, other, we have the implemented implementing guides to uh, so, in terms of societal aspects, it's very important to focus on the private life and the non-traceability. Uh, I think this is really an important aspect. And in addition, in addition to all these universal standards that will favor uh, this, I think we should not forget get uh, a, to leave choice to you to consumers. Imagine that tomorrow we only have the state wallet in, in the physical wallet for private and public transaction uh, transactions, it's, an, it's a mistake because each individual based on beliefs and opinions, people will not use the state wallet for certain types of transaction or conversely. And as I said earlier, the private sector can add more innovation in specific sectors and therefore this plurality between the public sector and the private sector is very significant. So we really have to build an ecosystem to exchange authentication with a business model that actually uh, is valuable, valid, and be, to make the investment. Without the investments to uh, to help uh, va attribute and uh, issuers and others, it will have no point. I mean, it's it's a matter for the commissions to have a specific focus to ramp up. Uh, the the companies that are ready and have the expertise to issue the services is capital for the success. Eric, I'm going. I've asked uh, underlying. I think that you are in uh, my underlying question. I think you're qualified to answer this. Actually, uh, trust is at the core of the matter. But I can only agree with what has been said before by my neighbors. Uh, once again, uh, as a reminder, one of our values at BeWise is the freedom of choice for end users. And I confirm what uh, Etienne is saying. We can, we should less leave the choice to users to choose his or her wallet <coughs> and, and choose with whom they share the data. That's the centralization. And also the uh, necessary support. 
So we, you all agree, but I noted with interest that an Italian decree that provides that their ecosystem will allow for a number of wallets, so allowing for different means of electronic identification before they have their own uh, a regalian one. I think it's an approach that we could uh, take with interest because in addition to being able to say I agree or not with whom I'm going to share my data, be able to choose your wallet seems to be a consensus to have the true freedom of choice and be able to choose how you use it. Well, I think that uh, we've... Uh, do, do we have some time left for questions? So I suggest that we have two to three questions maximum each time. Short questions, please. Do you have one? Thank you for for your uh, elements of information. So we didn't mention actually the case, the use case of transport and the use case of leisure and traveling. So uh, I can see the wallets I have in my smartphone. As soon as I enter a uh, theater ticket, a train ticket or a flight ticket, I have the uh, Google word that says, here I am, if you'd like to put it in, in here. So today I only have one wallet on my phone and it captures everything. It, there's not a lot of trust, uh, but it is there. So how do you see this evolution? Are there other use cases than payment and identity we talked about? We talked about digital uh, currency, which is uh, for the future. Are there other use cases that could change this question of intermediation? Who would like to answer? Laurent, you have the floor. Actually, it's a very good point. Today, the existing wallets on our phones have already had a lot of use cases, and we are we have gotten used to it. And uh, the uh, train tickets, uh, plane tickets, all that, and the buttons are adding add to your wallet. That uh, airlines is something that is uh, real. This is one of the challenges of digital identity wallet. Is at one point there is a desire to be top of the wallet and be uh, we'll have to develop a lot of features to be able to be uh, at par with what we have in all our phones because it's going to cohabit at one point. So I think that this is a, a significant uh, aspect you'll have to, we might, will not stop at uh, one point uh, or leave other use cases to the existing wallets. Now, having said that, we have mentioned, Etienne and myself, uh, some use cases that could be interesting when you mix the information and uh, identity and payment aspects or payments and uh, being able during the same transaction to get a certificate of a transport ticket as a certificate that certifies that I've actually bought my plane ticket, and this is what I will show at the gate. So this is the kind we are thinking about use case, innovating use cases like this one, where we can actually uh, get either your plane ticket, your payment receipt, and the single transaction we do with the wallet. So this is the kind of things that will create add value and ensure that you will give preference to the a DI wallet to existing wallet. It's clear there is a significant gap to catch up in terms of use case. Now the ID uh, DI wallet, uh, it will have other uh, assets like the Regalian for uh, use cases that uh, require a level of authentication that is very high. So I think it is being designed as we speak. There's no universal answer. There is no killer app or killer use case to, as of today. But this is uh, what is certain is that we'll have to find a couple, a couple of angles. Let's say we'll have several types of wallets potentially. 
Will there be specialized wallet for transport, others for traveling? Or we could imagine a travel agency specializing and creating a wallet for that. So we don't have a crystal ball for the moment, but it's very, a lot of possibilities. I'm just going to uh, re rebound on your judicious question, Guy, because we have four types of use cases. We have uh, this morning we talked about six, uh, whether it's uh, public sector or regulated private sector. We talked about WDC uh, for uh, for travel, for payments, uh, uh, also initiatives for students, uh, for their diplomas, or also for uh, also mobility throughout Europe. Uh, and if I understood correctly. <laughs> Uh, apparently, there's new uh, these uh, last sky pallets, uh, the LSPs. Uh, there's two uh, initiatives in place, and could we, could you respond to that? Yes, indeed. And in the case of the 2023-24 year work program, there's uh, funds that have been allocated to uh, new digital use cases. The budget allocated of 20 million euros will be financed 50% by the beneficiaries, which is the case also today with the current LSPs. And these LSPs will have a duration of 24 months. Now, I can't talk about the use cases, but I can, but, uh, but uh, the call for tenders will be launched in uh, the second quarter of 2024. The deadline for applications, will be quarter three, 2024. The palliations will be on the quarter, fourth quarter. The, the information will be communicated to the applicants will be also communicated on quarter four and we'll have new contracts for these OSPs uh, for first quarter of 2025. So, yes, it means that the European Commission is thinking of other use cases besides the LSPs. Are there any other questions if we have time? Yes, sir. Could you uh, maybe introduce yourself? The question is concerning the interoperability. So, for that a system has a lot of success, there is first of all the confidence. Il y a l'autre composante, c'est interopérabilité. On a beaucoup travaillé sur la confiance. We talked a lot about um, interoperability uh, in Europe. Everything is fine, but uh, we have a system in India, for example, that's a fan it's huge, but it's but it doesn't work with our system. So we have problems of interoperability with these two systems. Now, for payments like Visa. Is it possible to do something uh, like Visa has done to make sure the payments are interoperable internationally? In terms of wallet identification, uh, is there not a niche for uh, interoperability for uh, certain um, actors? Laurent, you want to intervene, For interoperability, I'm going to try to reformulate your question. You were basically asking, is there interoperability outside of Europe that's currently being uh, discussed? I think if I understand your question. The IDS2 uh, project is really about uh, European interoperability, but what about outside of Europe? To be honest, I don't know. I know that there are discussions between Europe and the United States. in order to harmonize things, but I don't know much more than that, unfortunately. In terms of global interoperability, I don't know if anybody else has. Uh, yes, there was a working group that was set up with a roadmap and between the uh, United States and the European Commission. The standards that will be implemented in the RF uh, initiative, uh, right now we already have the initial Standards is ISO 01305, which is uh, for international uh, uh, interoperability. And then we also have open source uh, initiatives as well. Now, there's other 
others like Microsoft who are trying to implement solutions, but those are proprietary solutions. So the idea is to have a European uh, solution uh, that will really allow for interoperability so that we're not attached to a private interests. Uh, now, once again, the open standards throughout the world, th these are not something that's been recreated. This is uh, based on the WV3C, uh, Verifier Credentials, is OpenID for VC. OpenID is, uh, is decentralized and for to for VC and for VC. Uh, these are international standards that do exist. Now, if there's other regions of the world that are going to adopt these standards or not, uh, today we don't know. Um, now, there are bilateral discussions uh, between the United States and Europe to establish on the basis of those standards a sort of interoperability, but at the world level, I got to tell you, just in Europe, it's complicated. So we're going to start with Europe, and uh, and then we'll say that the uh, European model might allow uh, to others to sort of like uh, find the way. So, so I thank you very much for this uh, roundtable. I thank you for your questions, and I think that uh, we can uh, applaud and thank our four presenters for their contributions here today. Thank you.